Hi, welcome back. We're gonna discuss today part two of offerings and brands. If you remember about part one, we were discussing mostly issues that deal with products, how these products uh, can be created, what attributes are uh, and features, and how we can use those to differentiate and to make our products different from the competition, how we can provide value for customers, and so on and so forth. Today, we're going to extend that part that deals with products to also include services, and we're gonna talk about brands as well. So we're gonna be mostly talking about services and brands in this part. Okay, so let's start with services. Now, when we're talking about services, we are essentially talking about performances, right? It's some sort of performance a service, so it's not an actual product, it's not a thing, right? And being a performance uh, has some intrinsically unique characteristics, right? And I'm going to focus on four that I think make services a lot more challenging and also potentially rewarding to handle uh, by companies. So these are kind of like a blessing and a curse, as you will see later. Okay, so let's talk about these four characteristics. Number one is intangibility. When we're talking about intangibility, what we are saying is that services per se cannot be uh, perceived by our senses before that performance actually takes place. So take any simple example, like uh, in our tax season, right? So uh, if you want to get your taxes done by a service like H&R Block, right? Uh, you cannot see uh, the tax services, you cannot feel them or hear them. You can just get the actual tax service performed and afterwards you will see what the results are, right? So this creates all sort of difficulties from a marketing perspective, right? So services are more complicated to convey and communicate to customers because they are lacking a lot of this uh, sense related information that we get with products. So knowing when something's gonna be of good quality or bad quality with a service beforehand is actually challenging, right? Number two, we have this aspect called inseparability. And this is essentially coming from this performance nature. And what it means is that you cannot distinguish between the service and the actual provider because they happen simultaneously. So until the service is performed, until you actually get the hard cut, right? The actual service doesn't exist per se. It's not something that you can see or touch. And in fact, when you go to the hard cut place, right? What they will do is they will show you maybe a magazine that has different hard cuts. Uh, but uh, seeing how that hard cut is gonna look on you until you actually get that haircut performed, it's, it's really not viable. And there's technology that will enable you to put the face. But in my experience, there is always a, a, some sort of difference between what you actually get and what it's supposed to be looking like when you have a model uh, of what that haircut or any other service is going to be. Right? So you have this inseparability, you have this intangibility. Another aspect that comes from this is that there is perishability in services. So the fact that they are performances means that the service per se cannot be stored. So it's not like a product where you can just produce a large number of products and just put them in storage. And then whenever there is demand for the product, you can sell more or less of it, depending on how demand fluctuates. That is not the case with services. Services need to be performed at the time that they are demanded. So if there is an airline that it's providing a, transportation service, right? If the plane departs with three empty seats, there is no way to store those three empty seats in storage and sell them to somebody else, right? So if somebody's actually not sitting in the plane at the time of departure, that uh, potential service and the potential revenue for the company disappears. So services are perishable, and that is gonna include all sort of difficulties with seasonality of demand and, and uh, determining the capacity for services. And then finally, we have this idea of variability, which is that because services uh, are heavily reliant on the employees that provide them, right? Uh, it's going to make the experience received by the customer vary from interaction to interaction. 
it's going to be very hard to standardize services. And some companies have done a pretty good job at doing this standardization process by using technology, machines as much as possible to try to limit the human interaction because that human interaction enhances the variability, right? So how many times have you gone to a restaurant that you really like, but for whatever reason that day, uh, the person that is uh, taking your order, they are a little bit upset, unhappy, maybe they just broke with the girlfriend, whatever it is, right? You don't know the reason why, but they are short, they are you know, maybe uh, not remembering things as well. Uh, people tend to have variable performance, okay? And that's gonna have an impact in how the service is perceived by the consumer. So because of these four unique characteristics of services, managing services is a lot more difficult than managing products. Now, having said this, also this creates a lot of opportunities for differentiation, right? So this enables companies that do a very good job at limiting these uh, issues, they make them extremely successful. McDonald's is a great example of this, right? So if you go into any global uh, country, any country in the world, right, and you want to have a quick meal, going to McDonald's, it's a safe uh, option. And the reason why is you know you're not going to have phenomenal food, but there is some basic uh, benefits that you know you're going to get. The restaurant is going to be reasonably clean, right, which is not a given for uh, other restaurants. It doesn't matter how nice the restaurant is. Right? And also, you know that there's a pretty good chance that you're not going to get sick. Now, those two sound like very basic benefits, but those are a consequence of the standardization of the processes that McDonald's have implemented to limit variability and make sure that the consistency of uh, the experience that you get, it's similar across different uh, experiences at McDonald's. So how do we manage these services? Well, there are a couple of unique aspects other than these four characteristics that I was describing or how services are by their own nature, by the fact that they are performances, right? Um, one is there are some frameworks that enable you to connect uh, services with profitability, right? So this idea that um, as you create this relationship between how good of a service you're providing, it's gonna eventually pay off by having customers come back and return. A typical model for that would be this idea of the service profit chain, right? Where you try to create a direct connection or linkage between the level of service, the satisfaction uh, with your uh, customers and translating that into ultimately profitability. Right? That's one aspect, right? That's not technically very different than what you do with products, but this is a specific uh, process that it's used within services. The next two are a little bit uh, different, or at least uh, more pronounced in the case of services, which are internal marketing and interactive marketing. Let me show you in a diagram what I mean by that. So here you have the three key components when it comes down to services. So first we have the company. This is the same thing as with products, right? And we have the customer, right? The customer is here in a way. So the interaction between a company and the customer, it's what the traditional marketing will be, right? So this is what we're gonna call external marketing. And this includes aspects such as advertising, right? Which every company is gonna do to a larger or smaller degree. So you're gonna be gathering information from customers to try to make your products better. And then you're gonna go back to your customer and try to communicate and engage with them to make sure that they understand what the product and value is for them so they actually come back and they buy the product for you. So this is the traditional marketing that we've been talking about. But then there are other aspects that are particularly important when it comes down to services. And the key piece of the puzzle here is employees. Employees are important in every business, but they are absolutely essential in services because of some of these aspects that we have mentioned, like for example, variability, right? The fact that the service is a performance means that the employees play a critical role in ensuring the satisfaction of the customer. So you're going to have this linkage between the employee and the customers, which we're gonna talk interactive marketing, which is essentially gonna dictate how satisfied and how happy the customer is with the service itself, because the service is gonna be delivered in situ by the employee. So having capable employees that are well-trained, that have 
and clear processes that enable them to make good decisions that basically keep the customer happy is absolutely essential, right? And we're gonna call this interactive marketing. The other part of the puzzle is this idea of the interaction between the company and the employees. And we're gonna call this internal marketing. Now having employees that are happy with the policies that are implemented within the company is absolutely essential. If we wanna keep our customer happy, we need to keep our employees happy because they are the front line. Many, many of the employees, maybe not all of them, but many of the employees are the front line of the firm. And the vision and the experience that the customer is going to get from the company is gonna be essentially dictated by how the employees are gonna interact with them. And because of that, this relationship between the company and the employee needs to be in a really good place. And we're gonna call this internal marketing. So we need to do marketing internally to make sure that our employees uh, know that they are doing a good job when they do and you know put the policies in place to rectify if there is any difference between what the company thinks should be happening and what the uh, employees are actually doing so that the customers are happy. Okay. So there is a layer, an extra layer of complication because of this interaction between employees and customers be so prevalent when it comes to services and also this imposes new opportunities to do a better job in the management of the firm. So this interplay between company, customer, and um, employees creates more degrees of freedom for companies to differentiate themselves. This is actually a good thing about services. So you can actually be different uh, in many different ways, in any way that the customer uh, deems to be valuable. So. I'm going to briefly discuss three different strategic ways in which you can differentiate yourself. One is by the offering itself. So you can have a service that is actually different. So for example, if you've ever shopped at IKEA, you will notice that on top of the actual products that they have in display, the arrangement of the store is somewhat unique. First is the store is really large and it has uh, a lot of the furniture that they sell in display areas that basically make almost like a maze that you uh, have to uh, continuously shop from beginning to end uh, it's actually hard to go from one place to the store to another without actually spending the time to look at the products that are in display they also give you a nice idea about how the furniture looks like instead of uh, by themselves uh, in situ right? But this is not unusual from furniture stores. But what it is unusual is because uh, there are only a few stores and they are rather large. They are destination shopping. So it's something that you might do for half a day or the whole day. It takes quite a bit of time to you know, go through the store. And in many cases, like for example, uh, for, for us in Richmond, uh, we don't have a store. So you have to drive for two hours to get to the closest IKEA. And that makes... Uh, additional services necessary or at least if not necessary it makes the trip a lot nicer so when you get there if you have kids because walking around the store with kids uh, might actually you know, be the best experience for both the kids and the parents and uh, they do have uh, child services that are free and uh, so you can just drop off your kids they have a good time uh, playing in the play structure that it's at the store with people that are making sure that the kids are safe. And uh, the parents can actually go and look at furniture without having to be worried about the kids at the same time. Uh, additionally, because oftentimes uh, the store trip turns out to be rather long, uh, and oftentimes people come from far away. What uh, IKEA does is it offers inexpensive uh, cafeteria style food uh, within the building so that it makes the whole trip a whole day affair uh, and it makes it easy uh, and convenient. Um, then other than the actual offering or the service uh, itself, uh, you can also uh, differentiate your service by having a different delivery. Uh, so what do I mean by this? By uh, offering uh, different ways in which uh, customers can actually uh, either receive the service or uh, conduct the service in a way that is more convenient for them. So if you've gone recently into uh, most grocery stores, uh, there is a move away from uh, cashiers 
at the store to self checkout and this in many cases when you're buying a small amount of products uh, makes the checkout process faster notice that the checkout uh, process at grocery stores is one of the uh, less satisfactory um, process parts of the whole interaction and companies have been working really hard trying to improve this with both technology and people and uh, the self-checkout lines is one of the ways that the companies have tried to improve the interaction between the customer and the organization but uh, there is technology on the way that is trying to uh, even speed up the process more by including uh, sensors in the uh, carts and having the products self-checkout directly to the cart and then uh, using a transmission between the cart and a cashier to just be able to seamlessly pay without having to scan the products on the way out now this technology is still in in the design process but you can actually work on the interaction between the company and the customer in multiple ways um, finally uh, there is image and brand efforts associated with service companies like there are with products uh, and this can be shown in many of the logos and uh, branding uh, images that companies have uh, selected to differentiate them their companies so for example you have a company like Prudential which offers life insurance uh, and essentially they use this large rock in in an area called Gibraltar actually it's right next to Spain um, and the idea with the rock is it tries to elicit in the customer this idea of solid uh, financial grounding by the image that it displays right so all these brand associations that uh, come from uh, this solid rock will hopefully translate into a positioning or perception of the company as having solid financial footing and because of that being a good uh, potential match for buying life insurance and continuing to talk about service differentiation I want to talk also about this interplay between service quality and service productivity and they are both closely linked together and uh, because if you try to dramatically improve one usually the other one is going to go down they kind of uh, to some degree at least they are uh, a little bit of polar opposites so if you want to provide a superior quality service you're not going to be able to uh, increase service productivity a lot that means how many services you can deliver in a certain unit of time right per day per hour whatever right so and I think this makes makes sense to most people right so if you want to really dramatically improve service quality that is going to come at, at least to some degree at the cost of productivity right? uh, now let's talk a little bit about service quality first now uh, let me just say services like with products for you to ensure that quality is high, it is absolutely essential to measure the degree of service quality. And this is not a trivial thing to do. There are uh, models that can be used that enable maybe be a survey to collect information from customers regarding service quality. Um, and this is important to basically uh, be an ongoing effort that enables you to know whether your quality is up to the standards that are necessary within the industry maybe surprise those of your closest competitors and one of the many uh, tools that can be used to do this is this model called SERPQL this is not a new tool but it's widely used and it kind of tries to look at the difference between the expected service level and the actual service level delivered to a customer and also they looked at multiple facets like responsiveness etc so it's a somewhat a complex model that uses a set of questions to measure the degree of service quality uh, within a firm and this can be used to make sure that we understand where we are and how we can actually make improvements to service quality so measuring is important uh, but it's not only about measurement just remember because we have a, a certain degree of variability always with services uh, it is absolutely essential uh, that the employees we have they have the right talent so hiring practices 
are very important. You need excellent employees so that you can deliver excellent uh, service quality and also productivity. They can come hand in hand. Um, and uh, on top of the actual hiring practices, you need to put quite a bit of effort in training. So you need to have processes in place that are going to enable uh, customer uh, representatives to be uh, well trained in the procedures that they need to follow to make sure that the customers are getting the right quality and on the back end that you have sufficient productivity. Um, there is kind of a trade-off, like I've already mentioned, between quantity and quality. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. It's very hard to improve both of these simultaneously unless there is some sort of process or a technology improvement that enables you to do both. Right? And with some of the online uh, companies, you can see that you can go work both in quality and quantity by uh, automat automatizing part of these processes and using technology but for the most part they tend to go in opposite directions and if you push for improvements for dramatic improvements in productivity is usually uh, something that has to give in quality so this uh, trade-off between the two uh, needs to be uh, taken into consideration when making a strategic decisions now, moving away a little bit from services, we have talked about products, we have talked about services, but what happens in most companies is that they do not have a single product or a single service, but you usually have a portfolio of products, a group of products that are actually offered by the company. And within that portfolio of products, there is something called a product line, which is essentially a group of products or services it could be that are closely related because they have some sort of uh, similar functionality right and um, so let me give you some examples so that you can see uh, what we mean by a line so here you have an example from a large corporation it's called general electric and general electric operates in multiple businesses so they have consumer appliances they also have other consumer products that are not as large maybe and they also uh, produce and distribute energy so they have their own energy generation business they make uh, engines for aviation so they make jet engines and they also uh, make uh, equipment for healthcare, especially medical imaging equipment. And they have uh, other businesses as well, some of which they have divested in the last couple of years. So they have uh, media and entertainment. This part has been sold, used to be uh, part of the, of the company, but in the recent years, this part has been divested. They also operate oil and gas, which is a different, uh, a different business altogether security and uh, capital services so they were a lender uh, a lot of these uh, services also have been sold since 2009 although they still have a, a financial arm and it's not particularly profitable in the last few years anyway but they operate in many many different businesses it's actually uh, from all the companies that i can think of and there are a couple others in south korea that are similar to this what are the most diversified in the sense that it operates in many different businesses and of course with all these businesses come a large number of products right so here you have for example within their appliance line some of the products or some of the SKUs meaning stock keeping unit uh, that they actually offer so they have washers they also have dryers they also have some combo products that are both washers and dryers they have refrigerators and dishwashers now each of these are considered a product line. Why? Because they are functionally very similar, okay? And because of that, they are gonna have to be managed more carefully because the decisions that we make about one product can have an influence in other products with the, the product line. So what can you do within the product line decisions? Um, well, the length of the product line is essentially the number of products that are in the product line that we were discussing before. So uh, companies over time, what they do is they usually uh, 
stretch the product lines by adding uh, different models that are appeal to different customer bases. Okay, so here you have an example of BMW, for example, which is a company that has successfully uh, stretched their product line downwards. So traditionally, BMW was a luxury company, or at least, you know, it's an upscale car company. And what they've done over time is they have introduced a less expensive vehicles into their lineup so that people that are aspiring to buy the more luxurious vehicles can still get into the product line by starting at the bottom. This is called line stretching, where you stretch your line vertically. Either up market will be going into more expensive uh, parts of the marketplace or down market, which is what BMW has been doing with, for example, the Series 3 and Series 2 and 1 in Europe. And they are not sold here in the US but because they are maybe too small for the market and maybe because there might be some concerns from BMW about uh, what they could do for, for the brand in terms of negative impact on that luxurious perception. But anyway, uh, BMW has been stretching their product line and filling in uh, product holes to make sure that they have a complete set of products starting with uh, the Series 8, seven, five, three, and like I said, series two and one, maybe in other markets. Okay. Now let's talk about brands. So we have talked about products, we have talked about services, and we have discussed briefly what a product portfolio is and what a product line is. And now all these products and services are going to have to be somehow uniquely identified as being part of the company and the job of that is that of the brand. So what is a brand? Is some sort of uniquely identifying symbol, sign, term, name or design that essentially makes unequivocal who that product or service belongs to, right? So it uniquely identifies the company that it's behind uh, the product or service in hopes that it will help differentiate that product from the rest of the products in the marketplace. Now notice brands are essentially a, a way of facilitating a decision making for customers because uh, if brands didn't exist, every time that a customer will have to go to the store, will have to evaluate all options and try to decide on what is the best without knowing a priori what to expect. But the brand, what it does is it helps customers make decisions by lowering the uncertainty of buying products if they have already have experience with that particular brand, maybe in other product categories or uh, other product spaces. Okay. So brands are absolutely quintessential uh, elements that facilitate in many ways customer decision making. Now with the brands, uh, what they also help the companies differentiate from the competitors and a way to do this is by creating this idea of brand associations, right? which is this set of cognitive structures that are built around the brand. Right, so if I talk about a brand like Coca-Cola, for example, and I ask you, when you think about Coca-Cola, what do you think about? There is this whole host of ideas that people associate with Coca-Cola that are common across many consumers. So people will tell you, I think about red, I think about something refreshing and sweet, bubbly, uh, I think about family, I think about Christmas, I think about Santa Claus, I think about polar bears. So there are all these associations that are built over time uh, through advertising in other forms of communication with customers that make the brand have its own personality and a whole set of hopefully positive traits that customers think about when they think about the brand. Now, associated with all this positivity, there is some financial backing. So what do I mean by this? Well, once that customers know your brand and they know what the brand positioning is, meaning what the brand stands for, and it has these clear brand associations that are positive, what this does is it creates a brand equity. Now, what is brand equity? Brand equity is essentially the additional financial rewards that a company should expect from having a strong brand. Uh, 
there are different ways of measuring brand equity but uh, a very typical way of measuring it will be to create two products or two services that have the same features and attributes so they will have the same price the same performance specs uh, same size whatever it is right take a laptop right so it will have the same screen size same weight same RAM memory, same resolution of the screen, same battery life, everything will be the same, but one will be a Mac and the other one will be a, I don't know the brand, like a no-name no brand, right? So the difference between the no-name brand and the Mac with the same specs is how much equity the brand brings into the decision process. So you can actually physically measure this by getting this measure per laptop then you can aggregate it to the whole firm and come up with an overarching metric of brand equity and good and and when you aggregate all this up what you end up coming up is with this idea of brand value right so equity is at the decision level and but brand value is basically the overall total financial value associated with having that brand so we have talked about how brands can have quite a bit of value for the enterprise or the company. And now we're going to discuss briefly how to build strong brands. So you're going to start with uh, determining the positioning of the brand. Then after the positioning is chosen, we're going to select a name for the brand that is unique. We're going to determine the type of brand that we're going to be dealing with and uh, determining the brand sponsorship. And then finally, we're going to talk about different strategies for brand development. Let me cover each of these in a little more detail in what follows. So how do we build strong brands? We start with positioning. Positioning is, I would argue, probably the most important aspect of this strong brand building. Positioning is how the consumer perceives our brand. What are the kind of brand associations that the customer uh, develops over time. So when they think about our brand, what do they think about? Now, how do we achieve this positioning is by selecting some sort of aspect of uh, the brand that we want to be known for. So this could be in terms of attributes. These are concrete aspects of the product or service that we want to be known for. So for example, Toyota is known for having reliable cars. Okay. And instead of specific features or attributes it could be some benefits that are derived from the product or service and now there is not a lot of distinction between attributes and benefits because they are related uh, attributes are concrete aspects of the product or service and benefits is what the customer derives from those attributes or maybe from a mixture of attributes so when i was talking about reliability in toyota and that will be closer probably to a benefit than it is to an attribute. And an attribute will be like a specific feature that something has. Like for example, if you develop a cell phone and it has three cameras in the front that have different features. Uh, for example, one is a white lens and the other one might be ideal for macro shots and the other one is just a regular lens. And that's an attribute, right? Or a feature. Okay, and then you have uh, beliefs and values, things that people think about the product. These are judgments, right? And, and judgments and benefits are probably harder to cover than attributes. Problem with basing your positioning on attributes is that these are a lot easier to be copied by, uh, by uh, competitors. So creating your positioning around benefits it's probably more useful and even better if you can move to the uh, beliefs and value systems, right? Because those are harder to copy by your competitors and it could actually uh, mean many things, right? So for example, when you look at companies like Tesla and you look at their uh, mission and what they're trying to achieve with their brand, they will talk about, not about products, not about attributes so they don't even talk about cars they will say that their business it's essentially about helping the transition to uh, alternative sources of energy right so the car for them is essentially a tool so as you're moving into the beliefs and value system 
Uh, and if you really stand for that and people really yeah. acknowledge that and understand that, uh, it, it stands to reason that it's going to be successful if people actually agree that that's actually a worthwhile exercise in society. So other than having a strong positioning, uh, what you also need to have is a unique name. Uh, so like we were mentioning from the beginning, branding is about this identifying set of characteristics that uniquely uh, how, uniquely determines uh, who the company is that it's actually making. The product is kind of like the identity of the product or service. Uh, now, there are different aspects that we can actually consider when uh, selecting a name. Um, first, uh, one thing that could actually be uh, useful, although it's not necessarily required, is that the name that you choose suggests some of the benefits of qualities that we want to associate with our product. Uh, an example of that would be, for example, head and shoulders, right? Which is a shampoo that, uh, according to PNG, Procter & Gamble, it helps you in two ways. One, by making your hair look nice, so that's why the head part is. And then also it helps you fight dandruff, which is an unsightly uh, um, uh, set of uh, dead skin that falls on your clothes. And because of that, they will deposit usually in the shoulders. So head and shoulders, it's kind of highlighting or hinting at uh, the benefits that are actually accrued by the uh, product. Another aspect that you might want to uh, want when you're selecting the name for the brand it's you want that name to be easy to be pronounced. Now, this might seem obvious, but uh, especially when you enter foreign markets, uh, the name selection might actually be limited because you are bringing the name, the brand that you already have created in your own market. This is exactly what happened to Mitsubishi when they started selling cars in the United States. This was probably early 80s. I don't remember exactly the time frame, but I remember that they had this, what I consider pretty cheesy and silly uh, set of commercials that all they try to do uh, is try to uh, have the American people learn how to pronounce the brand name because it's a name that it's a little bit lengthy and it has a set of syllables and maybe sounds that are not necessarily typical in English. Right. So essentially, it was a set of commercials that all they will do is come up with a jingle that was sort of catchy and for 30 seconds repeat the word meet you, we see, meet you, we see. And there was really not much to the commercials at all. They weren't trying to promote any of the products. They were just trying to introduce the brand name because it was there was a concern that people will actually struggle with it. Right. So easy to pronounce will be nice. Another thing that it's important is to be distinctive. If you have a brand name that it's very common or that it's associated with other things uh, could be problematic. So you want it to be unique and that people don't confuse it with something else. Uh, also, it's nice if it can be extendable. What that means is if you can take the same name maybe to other product categories. So if the product uh, sorry, if the name that you choose is very specific to the product category, that could be, in theory, uh, at least in the long term, potentially uh, not desirable thing. So if you're considering entering multiple different industries with the same brand name, uh, having a name that doesn't uniquely associate only with the product category might actually be useful. Okay. And point five, this is kind of related to point two, like I was mentioning before, it will be nice if the brand that you choose is actually something that can extend into other global markets that you're considering now for entering, especially if you have that idea from the beginning. Let me give you an example of a car name that didn't exactly extend very well. So uh, a few years ago, uh, Chevrolet had a car, a sedan, that was called uh, Chevy Nova. And Nova in Spanish means it doesn't run or it doesn't go. And obviously when they introduced the car in Mexico, uh, let's just say that sales were highly disappointing. And I don't think the executives realized that because of the implications of the name in Spanish, uh, the brand name was doomed from the beginning. And finally, you need to get approval from legal because obviously the name needs to be able to be uh, 
uniquely uh, identified and because of that if a company already is using that brand name in markets that you want to enter uh, it's going to be a problem so you need to be able to register that name legally in the different uh, copyright uh, offices in the markets where you want to operate so after you've picked your positioning and the brand name that you're going to use the question is what kind of brand or uh, sponsorship are you going to have what kind of what type of brand are you going to be? Is it, are you going to be a manufacturer's brand? These are the kind of brands that we usually think about. Uh, so Ford, Honda, HP, Mac. These are all manufacturer's brands that are unique to the company. They are directly related to the company. And uh, those are the kind of brands we usually think about when we're thinking about branding, but there are others, right? One of the kinds of brands that have become most prevalent uh, in the last few years, especially in consumer packaged goods, are private brands. These are brands that are uh, provided or sponsored by the uh, store. So every large grocery store has their own private labels, right? In fact, labels is the right term because they have multiple store brands that are used in different categories, right? So here there's a picture of Kroger's and brands uh, for the cookies that are just store brand. Of course, Kroger doesn't make any cookies. And these are uh, made by companies sometimes that have manufacturer brands. Sometimes they're uh, companies that the only thing they do is they work for private labels. So there is a mixture of both and both options are on the table. And so you have private brands, they have become extremely strong uh, in consumer packaged goods. Uh, this is not so much of an issue in other areas, uh, like other durable goods. If you're talking about electronics, it is less of an issue with private label brands. Um, but private brands have a very, very strong presence uh, in pretty much every economy, but here in the US especially. In fact, a lot of surveys will tell you that in some product categories, over 60% of the people seriously consider and consistently buy private labels. Okay. Another option is to license your brand. So uh, you have many examples. Uh, a good one would be Disney, for example. They, they have platforms that they developed around their products. And so you have these animated movies that they make, but the characters, the logos, and a lot of the copyrighted material that they create, they later leverage by licensing their um, characters and their movies uh, to other companies that make goods where those, uh, where those characters are actually placed. So you have all these all these uh, Mickey Mouse, everything from t-shirts to mugs to figures to toys, all these products are licensed uh, by Disney, right? So here you're getting the brand from somebody else, you're paying, paying a royalty or a fee for being able to use a strong brand. And this is a different strategic option that you can actually choose. And finally, another thing to mention is co-brands. So co-brands is when you join uh, with a different brand, which could be from your own portfolio of brands or from a different one, and you basically create a product that leverages both brands. Here you have an example of Philadelphia and Milka joining their forces. This is a product that was launched when um, Kraft, the parent company of both Philadelphia and Milka at the time, uh, decided to just join the strength of two brands into uh, an interesting product that I don't think it did very well in the marketplace. But uh, this idea of co-branding or using two brands, uh, it's used a lot. By the way, the brands don't need to be from the same company, like in this case. This is when uh, Kraft owned both Philadelphia and Milka. At this point, they don't own Milka because that part of their business was sold uh, to a new conglomerate, which is called Mondelez. But anyway, at the time this product was launched, both were part of the same manufacturer, but this can happen across manufacturers. For example, a lot of computer companies, they do co-branding on their laptops with uh, chip manufacturers such as Intel or AMD. So when they're talking about their, their brands, uh, it will be a co-branding effort. In this case is a special type of co-branding effort called ingredient branding that um, will basically emphasize and leverage 
the intellectual assets of other brands and that may or may not be part of the company's assets so you can actually do this by doing a strategic alliance with somebody else good and finally let's just uh, bring back to this idea of what kind of strategy you can use for uh, developing these strong brands well it's going to depend on whether you are using existing products or you're developing new ones or if the brand name is what you're developing either new brand names or existing brand names so let's just go through this two by two and uh, diagram right here quickly so if you're talking about an existing um, an existing product category with uh, an existing brand name we're going to call that a line extension so for example when bmw launched the three series in the united states in the 80s uh, that 3 series is still uh, uh, within their line of BMW cars and it will be considered a line extension. So it's an existing product category, so there's still cars uh, and using an existing brand name. So it's just a, a new product within the product line. Okay. On the other hand, uh, you have a brand extension when you take uh, an existing brand and uh, what you do is you introduce it into a new product category. That's when you jump from doing one thing to doing something else with the same brand uh, that you are actually using. Okay. Um, a different example, uh, or better said, a different strategy is when you actually uh, have several brands in the same product category. Uh, here I have three uh, types of laundry detergent. All these three brands are actually owned and manufactured by the same company. It's called Procter & Gamble. Okay, so what Procter & Gamble does is it diversifies the brand associations and brand offerings that they have in the marketplace depending on what kind of customer they are trying to target by having multiple brands that operate and compete within the same uh, set of uh, competitors, right? So you have the same market, it's all laundry detergent, okay? But, well, by market, I mean product category. Uh, but uh, what you're doing is you're targeting different segments by using slightly different positionings in this space. Um, in products that, unless you're a marketer, you probably don't know that they are related in any way. This is what we call a multi-brand uh, strategy, where you have uh, new brands in this case there are three in the same existing product category and finally the more obvious option is to introduce a new brand which will be something that you do a uh, new product category uh, with a new brand name and there are many examples of this obviously so for example when Lexus uh, sorry Toyota tried to uh, target um, luxury buyers in the United States uh, that was considered a new product category because it functions differently than traditional cars and to do that what they did is they introduced a new brand called Lexus which not everybody knows uh, and it was actually a success in this case